Hello everyone, this is Diamond Dustification from YouTube again. I can't tell you how frustrated I am right now. I've lost, I'd say, five hours of footage trying to make this video. I just keep getting error after error. It's very clear to me that there's some sort of wicked spirit that does not want me to get this published. I'm not going to give up though, okay? If there's no timestamps down in the description box, I may post them in the comments later. Make sure you check out the description box for all the usual stuff, such as links to my playlist, my email address, etc. Today we're going to be going over Matthew 24, and we got a lot to get go over, so let's get to this. Uh, we're going to rightly divide this, discern what it means, and try to understand as best we can. Remember that no scripture is up to any private interpretation, but especially revelations. And this ties into all of it. So let's start. We're going to begin in Matthew, right at the beginning. And Jesus went out, Matthew 24, 1, and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And he said unto them, Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, so we know where he is, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming? in the end of the world. So those are what this is talking about. Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. I don't know about you, but with all the people out there today parroting that we can lose our salvation, parroting a partial meritorious rapture, and many other things, I would say that that has already been fulfilled. For those that believe we can lose salvation, they do not believe in the all-sufficient sacrifice of Jesus Christ our Lord, and they have put their faith in another gospel and have gone about to establish their own righteousness, which we can see in, Re in Romans 10. 1 through 4, okay? Those that believe in a partial rapture are much the same way, believing that we merit our own rapture by being good in the flesh and producing good works, when in reality the good works are all about the Bema Seat judgment after the rapture. It has nothing to do with meriting the rapture. The rapture is a given. That's why there's a Bema Seat judgment, okay? We're not working for rapture. We are working for the kingdom of God, so that we will be rewarded in heaven and because of love and out of love for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, what about wars and rumors of wars? Well, have you turned on the TV every, every now and again? Have you looked at the news? Between everything going on with the Middle East, China, Russia, Japan, and America, and many other places, North Korea, South Korea, I would say that wars and rumors of wars is pretty pretty accurate description of the times we're living in today. Nation rising against nation is the same thing, kingdom against kingdom. Famines. The farmers have been complaining for years now that their crops are dying out. The bees are dying out. Many of you know that I was a beekeeper and am a beekeeper. We're losing all of our pollination. Pestilences. Remember the Ebola plague. Remember all the talk that's going on to this day about the superbugs in the hospital that they can't get, that they can't get rid of. Earthquakes. You can't turn on the TV without hearing about some natural disaster. I just lost power recently. I just got it back within a couple hours ago. And all this is happening all around the world. They shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my namesake. Well, there's very few places nowadays where Christians aren't persecuted. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Over in, in the Middle East, you can have your head cut off if you bear a testimony of Jesus Christ. Here in America, you will be persecuted in another way, financially. They will come after your job. They will try to get you to forsake the way of God. You see, the Lord told us that we should be obedient unto our rulers, for nobody is appointed except they be appointed of God. But he did tell us also that we should never yield to their demands if they tell us to do and yield to ungodly things. So when they try to force people, priest to marry two homosexuals when the Bible is very clear that homosexuality is an abomination before our Lord. We have an obligation to say no and put our Lord and Savior first. Do you understand? 
Inequity shall abound and the love of many shall wax, wax cold. It doesn't say that that love will be lost, but that it will wax cold. But he that endure to the end shall be saved. Okay? We are saved because John 5, 4 through 5 tells us that we are made overcomers by, by our faith. And he, and he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. And who is in us? Jesus Christ our Lord and his Holy Spirit. And the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So now the, the subject has changed. The end has now come. The abomination of desolation, which cannot happen until he who now letteth who let, which is us in the Holy Spirit, that is, the church in the Holy Spirit. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth let him understand. Now why is that there? Because those who see this thing unfold will know exactly what is being what is happening here. This is a now some people will say that he's alluding to a future generation, which is true. But he's also alluding to those who are going to be in the tribulation period. And we see that in the contrast of of who it's being spoken to here. Then let them which beware in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. If you are a mother in the tribulation and you can't find your child, that is because your child has been raptured. He's been taken up to be the Lord. Okay, it, Even if you were pregnant with a child and that child is suddenly gone, if you're no longer pregnant, that child is with the Lord. The best thing you can do, instead of searching and running around frantically looking for him or her, is to put your faith in Jesus Christ because in that way will you ensure that you will meet him again. Okay, Or maybe meet him for the first time. But pray ye that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Who keeps the Sabbath? Now there are some Christians who keep the Sabbath, but for the most part this is a reference to who? The Jews. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor sh shall ever be. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, the elect Jews, those days shall be shor shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. <clears throat> For there shall arise many false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Notice what it says there. If it were possible. If it were possible. Meaning it is not possible that they can deceive the elect. In the same way that we in the church age, the age of grace, are, not, are kept by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, so too will those elect in the tribulation be kept by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They will not fall away. They will not lose their salvation because they are elect of God, not because of their own merit. It, it is not possible that they will be deceived even by these great signs and wonders. Behold, I have told thee before, wherefore if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. The desert, the secret chambers, Jews. I've got to keep checking this to make sure... Um, that I don't that my don't lose my recording again, okay? For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there shall the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, so the, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man. In heaven, and they, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with heaven, with power and great, great glory, the clouds of heaven. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the one end of heaven to the other. Elect from the four winds implies Jews. This is the elect of Jews, okay? And we're going to see that. It's interesting that the parable of the fig tree comes just after this, which establishes that. Keep in mind also that this has no contextual relevance to the rapture verses. They do not sound the same because they are not the same. These are two distinct events, and we're going to look at that. The lesson of the fig tree. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When its branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So this is referring to when Israel became a nation again in 1948. Our generation is, is 70 to 80 years long, depending upon the strength of that generation. So likewise, ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. What does that mean? We are the last generation until the rapture, according to the prophecy here. Now, I'm not claiming to know the day or hour, but, I, but that doesn't mean that we can't recognize the season, okay? But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. If you claim to know the day or the hour, 
and you are speaking unwisely. And guess what? The post and mid-tribulation rapture both claim to know the day or the hour and the time. Okay? Because you're saying that you know that, that it will happen on a specific day at a specific time. Okay? That is, in the tribulation, the time or the hour, at this day, the mid or the post-trib. Therefore, you are in violation of Matthew 24, 36. But as of the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For in those days, <clears throat> for as in those days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. The Gentiles enter into the ark <clears throat> and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two shall be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left, under one to perdition, the other into the millennial. Two women shall be grinding flour at the mill. The one shall be taken and the other left. That is what this is referring to, flour. Some people have a real hang up with this verse. Which therefore, for ye know not what your Lord doth come. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Excuse me. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in which watch the thief would come, he would have watched and not would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Who then is that a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all of his goods. But, but and if that evil servant, unsaved, shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, we're going to go into this, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and eat and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So that is Matthew 24 in a nutshell. Rightly divided, compared to scripture. If you're going to try to dissect these things, you need to know the whole of the Bible. You need to look at the prior chapters and the, and the upcoming chapters. You need to know the entire gospel that you are reading. That is the gospel of Matthew in this case, and as well as the other gospels. You need to have a firm understanding of prophecy and revelations. And you need to do your research and look because the... And, and compare your opinions and your, your revelations to that of others. Because the scripture is not up to any private interpretation. Okay? It says as much in the Bible. Now take a look at these verses here. And pay special attention to the color codes. Because these, this is what we're going to be going over. Now the first thing we need to talk about is the fact that this is two distinct events. That is the second coming and the rapture. The rapture says... 1 Corinthians 15, 51, and 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. Okay? For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Romans, Revelations 9, 19, 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Okay? Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. Zechariah 14, 4. His feet shall stand on, in that day upon the Mount of Olives. 14, 5. And all the saints with thee. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. Revelations 19.11, the second coming. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he, he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True and Righteousness. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. We've already established that a man who takes his wife will not go out to war immediately. So if Jesus Christ, if the rapture is post-trib and we are to go to war with him, he is breaking his own law when he came to fulfill the law. Okay? All will be fulfilled, not some. Second, he comes on a white horse. What's the point of going up only to come back down? Okay, so let's take a look at this. As we can see from the above, Matthew 24, 29 through 31 describes the gathering of the elect by the angels. But the verses which refer to the rapture only mention the voice of the archangel in the midst of which we rise to meet Christ. There is no description of being picked up and taken by angels to Christ. Two distinct events. In similar fashion, when comparing the other scriptures along alongside each other, we see yet more distinctions. Revelations 19.14 describes us as coming with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the description of the second coming also makes a clear distinction between, between Jews and Gentiles, while not at all meshing with any of the rapture verses. In Revelations 19.11, we see Jesus return on a white horse. No such thing is mentioned in the rapture verses. 
Finally, in 1 Corinthians 15, our Lord Jesus Christ comes by himself and does not touch down on the Mount of Olives, whereas in Matthew 24, when the language is compared to its, other, to its cousins, we know he descends with an army and does touch down. Now, it says he has the voice of an archangel and the trump of God, but it is Jesus who possesses this voice and Jesus who possesses this trump of God. He is by himself. The Lord himself shall descend with a heaven with a shout. He has the voice. He has the trump. The gathering isn't, happens in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Yet the second coming paints a completely different description. Okay? Similarity. The mention of a trumpet does not prove sameness. Just because a same word might be used does not mean that that word holds the same meaning. Fear has a lot of meanings in the Bible. Okay? We're going to look at that in the future too. The day and the hour. Matthew 24, 14, and then shall the end come. There's that distinction. Of that day and hour knoweth no man. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, Luke 21, 24, and shall be led away captive into all nations in Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be trodden down to the Gentiles until what? The time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part it happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So we know that that blindness is going to be removed from Israel in the time of the tribulation because that's when they're going to be sealed and flee into the wilderness with the testimony of Christ, Revelations 12. So the fullness of the Gentiles must come in before the start of the tribulation. We also know that the Jews are sealed at the start of the tribulation as well, Revelation 7. Once again, fullness of the Gentiles must have come in. For in that day is great, Jeremiah 37. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. There it is. How long is the tribulation period? Seven years. The seven, it's the last week of Dan, Daniel's 70 weeks. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months, three and a half years. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for inequity and bring ever, in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision of prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Who is his people? Israel the Jews. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week, three and a half years, he shall cause the sacrifice to cease. If we read Matthew 24 carefully, we see that the subject being discussed changes multiple times. In 24, 1 through 14, the signs of the times are discussed, okay, along with a reference to the rapture. And 15 through 31 speaks of the tribulation period, okay. The abomination of desolation, he who now letteth will let. Who is he who lets but, but the Holy Spirit in the church? That is us. The second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It also speaks of that. And, and 32 through 51 establishes the rapture. No man knows that day or hour. Okay? Well, now let's figure out what's going on here. Who are the elect? And we're going to be going into this more deeply than what I have here. His elect from the four winds. Elect from the four winds and the trumpet. Pay attention to those. Now, Exodus 19, 16 through 18 establishes that a trumpet is a call to a meeting in some cases. But Isaiah 65 through 7, 16 paints an interesting picture. Your inequities and the inequities of your fathers together, saith the Lord, which have burned incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the hills. Therefore will I measure their former work into their bosom. So let's take a look at that. The elect are the faithful, believing Israelite remnant in contrast with the unbelieving sinners within the nation. In Isaiah 65, 7 through 16, God drew a contrast between these two groups and their destinies. In verse 9, he called the believing remnant mine elect. And in verses 17 to 25, he indicated that in the future millennial, his elect remnant of the nation will be blessed greatly on earth. Okay? If any of thine be driven out into the outmost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. This is a proof that heaven, that earth can be referred to as heaven, okay? Because nobody's going to be driven out when they're in heaven, okay? That doesn't make any sense at all. So this is talking about earth. I want you to keep that in mind. And you can read this for yourself as well. So let's talk about scattered into the winds, his elect from the four winds. I want you to keep that in mind. We're going to look at Ezekiel 5.10 and Ezekiel 17.21 first. Therefore the father shall eat the sons in the midst of thee, and the sons shall eat their fathers, and I will execute judgments in thee. And the whole remnant of thee will I scatter into what? All the winds. 
Okay, who is he talking about here? Well, let's go there right now and take a look. Jerusalem, the Jews. Okay. Wherefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, truly, because thou hast defiled my sanctuary with all thy detestable things and with all thy abominations, therefore will I also diminish thee. Neither shall mine eye spare thee, neither will I have any pity. As Ezekiel 17, 21, which is talking about what? Parable of the two eagles and the vine, okay? Which is talking about Israel. And all his fugitives with all his hands shall fall by the sword, and they that remain shall be scattered toward all the winds. And ye shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it, Okay? In the mountain of the height of Israel will I plant it. Zechariah 2.6, which is talking about what? Um, the man with the measuring line, okay? And, admit, and what is that talking about? O daughter of Zion, all about Jerusalem and Israel. Ho, ho, come forth and flee from the land of the north, saith the Lord. For I have spread you abroad as the four winds of heaven, saith the Lord. 2.6, okay. And said unto him, 2.4, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as, as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I, saith the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about, and will be the glory in the midst of her. Ho, ho, come forth. Flee from the land of the north, saith the Lord, for I have spread you abroad as the, as the four winds of heaven, saith the Lord. So who is this? Who are these elect scattered abroad? Israel and the Jews. Isaiah 27, 13, And it shall come to pass in that day that the great trumpet shall be blown, and they shall come which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria and the outcast in the land of Egypt, and shall worship the Lord in the holy mountain of Jerusalem. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations, Isaiah eleven twelve, and shall assemble the outcast of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judea from the four corners of the earth. It is quite clear that since the church is not mentioned in Matthew 24, verse 31 cannot be a reference to the rapture of the church. Instead, as one studies the context and Old Testament references to our, that our Lord alludes to, it becomes quite clear that he speaks of an end-time regathering of elect Israel in order to return them to the land for the millennium. At Christ's first coming, he wept over Jerusalem and expressed his desire to gather Israel to himself. The way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were unwilling. The Jews were unwilling. Matthew 23, 37. At his second coming, elect Israel will look upon him whom they have pierced. Zechari Zechariah 12, 10. And say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Psalms 118 to 26. Matthew 23 to 39. Maranatha. Let's take a look at that last trump now. Immediately after the tribulation, with the great sound of a trumpet. Okay? Gather together who? Israel and the Jews. For the Lord himself shall descend from the heaven with the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God. But in the days of... but Now, 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 now compare 1 Thessalonians 4.16 to Matthew 24.31 and you can already see that there's a difference here. Like I said, our Lord comes with his own voice, with the trump of God, by himself. He doesn't touch down. There is no gathering of angels, but we rise up to meet him. We do not turn around and come back. Revelations 10, 7 also says something interesting about the seventh trumpet of Revelations. But in the days, plural, of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. What is finished? The mystery of God. This points that, th that these trumpets are pointing to future events. And I want you to keep that in mind as we go forward here because it's going to be important. The seventh revelation trumpet also goes on for many days. That means that it cannot happen in a moment or the twinkling of an eye. Moreover, the wrath starts in Revelation 6, 17. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? For God hath not appointed us to wrath, the saved Christians, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. Okay? These are pointing towards divine judgment that is about to fall in the bowls. So let's take a closer look, though. Number one. A person can't overlap the trumpets with the last seal because the seventh seal is a half hour of silence. You can find that in Revelations 8. And trumpets can't sound during a silence. Some say that the rapture is the seventh trumpet, but that can't be right because none of the trumpets can start until after the seventh seal. You can find that again in Revelations 8. And the fifth trumpet takes at least five months, Revelations 9.5. Therefore, the trumpet plagues in Revelation 8 cannot be the same as the trumpet call of God 
in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, because they can't start until after the multitude is already in heaven, Revelations 5 and 7, plus the fifth trumpet, five months. Can't happen in the twinkling of an eye. The problems with the mid-tribulational rapture view as well as the partial rapture are fourfold. Number one, it is impossible to espouse a mid-tribulational view of the rapture and hold to the concept of eminency. According to this view, the appearance of the Antichrist, his covenant with Israel, and the destruction caused by the four horsemen must occur before Christ can return. Therefore, the rapture cannot happen today. Yet it says that we know not the day or the hour. And if you go to 2 Thessalonians 2, remember what I told you before, okay? Let no man deceive you, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. This is likely referring to his signing of the peace covenant. Now, even though these two verses are connected by the semicolon, 2 Thessalonians 2.4 is merely a description of the Antichrist and the man of lawlessness, okay? These, these are not preludes to that day, okay? Except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition is where this sentence ends. This goes into a description of who the son of perdition is, understand? The rapture can happen at any time. The last trumpet of 1 Corinthians 15 and the seventh trumpet are not identical. The last trumpet of 1 Corinthians 15, the same as that of, 1 of Thessalonians 4, 16, first, signals the completion of the believer's salvation as he meets his Lord. The seventh trumpet is the last one in a series announcing divine judgment on earth. There is even a later trumpet sounded during the tribulation to gather the elect of the second advent, Matthew 24, 31. Similarity does not prove identity. Just because there's a trumpet mentioned doesn't mean it has to be the same trumpet in this verse, you understand? Even the first part of the tribulation reveals God's wrath, not simply human or satanic wrath. Those in Revelation 6, 16 through 17 recognize that the sealed judgments are the wrath of the Lamb. In Revelation 5, it is Christ who breaks the seals and releases judgment on the earth. The two witnesses of Revelation 11 could not possibly be the church because the witnesses are literally killed and lie in the literal streets of literal Jerusalem for three days. Some Bible scholars prefer to see the prophet's ministry begin at the midpoint of the tribulation and conclude prior to the second advent. The seventh trumpet ushers in not the second half of the tribulation, but the messianic kingdom. And here you can read some of those verses which are alluded to up here. I want you to keep an eye on the 12 stars, because we're going to be getting into Revelations 12, because that ties into the mid-tribulation. Let's take a look at the wicked servant first, because some people will say that these wicked servants lost salvation, okay? The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son, Jesus Christ. So God the Father made a marriage for Jesus Christ, his son. He sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden, the prophets, calling the Jews to the wedding, and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden. Behold, I have prepared my dinner. All things are ready come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants, it's interesting they're called remnant, and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king thereof heard, he was wroth and sent forth his armies and destroyed these murderers and burned up their city, the destruction of Jerusalem. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. So go unto the Gentiles and bid them to the marriage to make the Jews jealous. Here is another parable. And, and here I'm going to go all the way down to Matthew 24, 41. But first we're going to look at 38. But when the husband man saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the hair. Come, let us kill him. And let us seize on his inheritance. So the Jews killed Jesus Christ. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord therefore out of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto these husbandmen? They say unto him, he will miserably destroy these wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen. So the Gentiles are called husbandmen too. So you can be a husbandman, a servant, and not be saved. You understand? But the Gentiles will, will produce the fruit in their season. A nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. And what fruit is he alluding to? Well, Re Romans 6 tells us. Now being made free from sin you and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end thereof everlasting life. For all have become under the condemnation of sin, but thank God that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Interesting. But let's take a closer look. Now I said that the children of the kingdom are unsaved. But the good seed in Matthew 13, 38 are called the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. But if you look at Matthew 18, 12, the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness and shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, trump, trumpet, trumpet, trumpet. It doesn't have to mean the same thing. You understand? 
you have to know the context of the particular verse you're reading. I'm sorry that I keep checking to make sure that I haven't lost my recording here. Let's take a look at the more interesting proof, though. Did you uh, happen to catch Matthew 24, 51? Shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites, so shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Lord of that servant's going to come upon this man in an hour when he looketh not for him. Luke 12, 46, which parallels Matthew 24, 51, says the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour when he is not aware and will cut him asunder and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. If he has a portion with the unbelievers, he's not saved. But the more interesting proof here is the fact that he comes upon him at a day when he looketh not. Because 1 Thessalonians 5, 4, and 5 tell us that that will not happen to a truly saved believer. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. So if the day overtakes you as a thief, then you are in darkness. You are children of light, and the children of the day, we are not of the night nor of the darkness. Okay? So if he's of the darkness, he's not saved. And where do we find that proof? Well, we look at 1 John 1, 5. If we say that we, this, this, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him we, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. And what is the truth? Well, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So the truth is Jesus Christ. Moreover, what does this person do? He smites his fellow servants and eats and eats with the drunken and the liars of the world. What did 1 John just tell us? We walk in fellowship. We have fellowship with one another if we are in Christ. Unsaved. Now we're going to talk about the stars falling from heaven. We got a lot to take apart here. Okay? Matthew 24, 29 says, And the stars shall fall from heaven. Okay? And then we go to Revelations 12. We're finally getting into that. And it says that his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And a dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered. Who's the dragon? Revelations 12, 9 tells us. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So the angels and Satan were cast out. Okay. Now, we know that Satan is called the sun of the morning or the morning star, whereas Jesus Christ is called the bright morning star. There's a difference. Satan has a false light. Jesus Christ is bright. He is the light of God, for he is God. Okay? We know that Satan is going to be thrown into the pit for a thousand years to be released and then finally truly defeated. And we want to take a look at the elect again. Okay? Now, you can read all these verses if you want. There's more parallels here. Joel talks about this. The star shall withdraw their shining. And we also see something interesting here in Revelations 120. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Now, the reason I'm pointing this out is because sometimes angels are called fellow servants. It is possible that the Bible may refer to saved Christians or those Christians in glorified bodies as angels. That paints an interesting picture for the pre-tribulation rapture. Okay? Revelation 6.13 talks about stars falling from the heaven, as does 9.1. 8.10 and 8.12, okay? Or the stars being blotted out into darkness. As we can see from the above, the stars fa falling from heaven best meshes with what? The angels being cast out along with their leader, Satan. But this also proves the error of mid-tribulation rapture as the events described in Revelation 12 point towards a continuation of events and a herald towards the coming bold judgments in the millennial reign. Oftentimes, the man-child will be spoken of in this instance, but since the woman who flees to be protected in the wilderness best represents the Jews, especially with a crown upon her head and the man-child Jesus Christ our Lord, it makes no sense to put the rapture here. There was no mention whatsoever of any form of judgment taking place. I'm feeling a little lightheaded, guys. I'm sorry about that big breath I just took. Whew. The two latter verses here establish a coming reality, but they do not signify any present tense event. So we're looking at these right now. So let's look at the two latter verses I just spoke of. Now the mid-tribulationists say that the wrath begins here. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath has come, and the time of the dead that, the de that they should be judged, and that thou should give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great. And they should destroy them which destroy the earth. Now I already told you that the trumpets are heralding future events. Keep that in mind. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. The two latter verses are not present tense, okay? 
Revelation 6.17 implicates that the entire tribulation period is God's wrath being poured out on an unbelieving world, but if the mid-tribulationist is going to argue otherwise, suggesting that, that it is future, then the same argument can be made for 11.18-19 11, revelations. There's only one problem, and that's that the mid-tribulationist argument against Revelation 6.17 would have to leave out verses 15-16, through 16, which come right before, both of which do imply present tense reality. Whereas nothing, nothing in Revelations 11, 18 through 19 does, okay? Trumpets are often used in the Bible to signal future events in times of war. The great day of his wrath is come, and what did they say? Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. Now let's finally establish who the woman is. We're going to focus on the crown, Satan who is waiting to devour the child, the child who will be born will rule over all the nations. And then we're going to take a look at this here. So let's do some comparisons here. First of all, let's let's establish who the child is first, or at least to point towards it. If we go all the way down to Matthew 2.13, we find out who Satan is waiting to devour as soon as he's born. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. As soon as Jesus Christ our Lord was born in that manger, Satan was waiting to devour him. But he fled. Or Jesus Christ was taken by his parents, and they fled into they fled to safety. Okay? As from a warning from God. Okay? So let's take a look at the crown the crown. And the fact that this woman flees into the wilderness to take her place, okay? Well, I'll read this in comparison. And the woman were given two and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time, three and a half years from the time, face of the serpent serpent. Okay? Now look at this comparison to Hosea two fourteen. Behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. Who's that talking about? Well, let's take a look. The Lord's mercy on Israel. Let's take a look at those 12. Who are the, what are the 12 stars representative of? The 12 tribes of Israel. So this woman is representative of Israel. The man child is Jesus Christ. We know that salvation is of the Jews and he will rule with a rod of iron. Okay? Israel is often referred to as the wife of God. If any man put away his wife. So let's look at Isaiah 54, 1 through 6. The eternal covenant of peace. Israel. Jeremiah 3 1. Faithless Israel called the repentance. Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up under, upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and, he, and he, there hath played the harlot. And I said, After she had done all these things, turn thou unto me, but she returned not, and her treacherous sister Judea saw it. And I saw when for all these causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. Jeremiah 3, 6 through 11. This whole chapter. Hosea 2, 14, as I already pointed out. I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. Okay? Isaiah 19 or 9 6 for unto us what a child is born unto us unto us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called wonderful counselor the mighty God the everlasting father the prince of peace that's interesting because what does this say he will rule all with the nations with a rod of iron and the government shall be upon his shoulder there it is what does this say John 4:22. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. If it weren't for the Jews, we would have never been given a Savior. You understand? Salvation is of the Jews. God is not done with his people, Israel. Okay? Yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that, that is to be ruler of Israel. So let's look at that rod of iron. Okay? Genesis 3.15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. I will declare the decree, the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Who is that talking about? Jesus Christ. Psalms 2, 7 through 9. Revelations 19, 5, the second coming. What does that say? And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he should rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. 
The Lord saith unto me, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Psalms 110.1. Romans 9.4. Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises? Whose are the fathers and of whom is concerning the flesh Christ came who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. He is over all. But when the fullness of the time has come, God sent forth his son made of woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons saying, Where is he that is born, king of Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and are come to worship him. O Lord our God, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. This has nothing to do with the mid-tribulation. The woman is representative of Israel. The man-child is Jesus Christ our Lord. The dragon is Satan. And the woman will flee for three and a half years at the end of the, near the end, ending of the tribulation to be protected by God because she bears the testimony of Jesus Christ, which means there's no post-trib either because the Israelites, these sealed elect Israelites and Jews are saved. And if there's post-trib, there will be nobody left to repopulate the millennial kingdom. Do you understand? And it has nothing to do with mid-tribulation. All of this stuff comes together, brothers and sisters, if you read the Bible and rightly divide. I don't have a problem if you believe in the mid or post-trib or pre-wrath or any of that stuff, but the problem is, is that many people that believe in the post or mid-trib think that we can lose our salvation. They think that they have to maintain their salvation, and yet the Bible makes it very clear that we are saved by faith and only faith. I will not blot out his name, he that overcometh. You will not be blotted out of the book of life if you overcome. And how do you overcome? 1 John 5, 4. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that, he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Okay? Those that believe we can lose our salvation, believe, say things like this. I will worship and obey Jesus Christ because if I don't, I will go to hell. But a once saved, always saved person says this. I will strive to obey Jesus Christ with the power of his Holy Spirit put within me because of what he has done for me and because I love him. Okay? Love is the fulfillment of the law, not fleshly effort. We are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. But what exactly does that mean? Well, Psalms 2.11 tells us, Serve the Lord with reverence, fear, and rejoice in trembling. And if you do not believe that this kind of fear is talking about reverence, then take a look at 2 Corinthians 7.15. This is talking about how Titus being received by this church, and it says they received him with fear and trembling. Were they cowering in a corner somewhere? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but it is not the end of wisdom. Okay? And it says that there is no fear in love. Now it says there's no fear of God, no reverence of God before them. That's true. But perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. And he that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he loved us first. Whosoever loveth is born of God. We will never be separated from his love. Love is synonymous with salvation. Love is the fulfillment of the law. And God's love is shed abroad in our hearts. By the Holy Spirit. And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us. Self-fulfilling. Salvation is Jesus Christ. He is the author and finisher of your faith. If you want to be saved, get down on your knees in a quiet room with a little white noise, as I always recommend, like an air conditioner. Say, Pray that he would come into you and grant you a faith unto salvation. Try to put all pretense aside. Don't try to save yourself. Don't try to clean up your act. Don't worry about what you've done or what you haven't done. Okay? All of that comes after. You are saved unto good works. Okay? You are not saved by good works. You are not kept by works. Do you understand? Sanctification of the Holy Spirit comes after. The fruit of the Spirit, every good tree produces good fruit. That fruit is inward, not outward. That's the error of the Lordship salvationist. They say that you got to help 7,000 grannies across the street if you want to be or stay saved. But the reality is, is that every good tree does produce good fruit. Because the good fruit that you will produce is the fruit of salvation. Your first fruit you produce is salvation. 
belief unto salvation. Okay? 1 Corinthians 15. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, down into it. He was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He was crucified on the cross of Calvary, shedding his blood and water for the forgiveness of our sins. He took the wrath of God meant for us upon himself. He died. He rose again on the third day after having been buried. He was seen of many. He ascended into heaven. And he is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven, having been appointed judge. Okay? If you believe that, you will be saved. We are the righteousness of Christ. You understand? We have been freed from the law. <sighs> well, I hope this video has been a blessing to you. And thank goodness it actually went through this time. If you're seeing this, I poured in probably 10 hours of work into this video. I am exhausted. Here's hoping that no YouTube doesn't have any trouble with it. Amen and amen. God bless you, brothers and sisters. Occupy and redeem the times.